I think I got my first pack when I was like 12, 13 years old. A dude around the neighborhood gave me a 250 pack, told me bring him back 200, keep $50. That's where it began. It was pretty much a product of your environment type situation for me. All the older dudes, they was already in the streets. So it was pretty much just following right behind their footsteps. Um, everybody else, you know, it, it's, just, it's, it's a thing where it's, though, it's, it's pretty much almost destined. This is where um, I spent most of my childhood at, in this house right here. This where the first verse of Christ Lives Forever was inspired. A lot of partying went on. After my grandmother died at a very young age, my family kind of fell apart. It was pretty good, Antonio, growing up. I can't say that he had it hard. He was spoiled. I know that much. Yeah, he was poor, but most of all, he was a good kid. I had a, a, a pretty decent childhood. My mother had an okay job. Um, she was working a bunch of hours to take care of me. He was with my sister when I was working most of the time, about 60, 72 hours a week. In the very beginning, I was home a lot. Then I basically started staying with my aunt. And, um, and staying with my aunt basically was with my cousin all the time. He was more or less like a, a a little brother to me. Like, I was more or less responsible for him because his mother worked a lot. So, like, I, he, I, I was always with him, like, majority all the time. Most of his friends was his cousins that he uh, used to be with. I met a couple of his little schoolmates. His mother was the protector of my mother. My mother was quiet, naive type woman, and his mother was outspoken. So she was like her her protector. When something went wrong or something, she came to protect her bigger sister. My, my mother was the oldest of all the sisters. My father, of course, he wasn't nowhere to be found. Um, even though he lived 20 minutes away, um, he wasn't there. I knew who he was, but it, it wasn't because I met him. It was because of the stories that my mom told me about him. Um, I, I have seen him because he lived in East Baltimore. I lived in East Baltimore. But um, it was through like passing, maybe at the supermarket or something like that. To me, family was watching an episode of Good Time. Wondering why is that mother like that, but then my mother and father is like this. I grew up with plenty of kids that never ever met their father, ever. Never met their mother. A lot of kids who were on their own at an early age, I'm talking eight, nine years old, they was on their own, when they eat for their self, do everything for their self. Because their mother was on drugs. And that fall was nowhere to be found at all. I mean, you be needing that male figure in your life. And, um, you know, growing up how I grew up, you don't get that male figure. You, sent, you tend to turn to the streets for that. And it's already like older dudes on the block or whatever. They ready to play that male role because of the role they want you to play for them. It was rough. I mean, it was very hard place to survive in because if you don't stay on your game, the streets will literally swallow you. You know, the circumstances is, is either you go get it or you don't eat. Just that simple. I was worried about him when, when he was out there in the streets and I was working 60, 72 hours a week and he was supposed to have been at home, in the house, and he wasn't in the house. I like school. The problem came just getting mixed up with the wrong crowd. You know, just started hooking school, started doing other things that wasn't supposed to be doing, like smoking marijuana and 
cigarettes and, you know, just drinking and all the all the wrong things, you know, just being mixed up with people, um, bad influence, peer pressure. That's what caused me to go left. You know why, how some kids are just good and they want to do something bad? <laughs> That's what that was. He was good, he just wanted to do something bad. <laughs> I remember is total silence. I didn't really feel it. But when I got shot, um, everybody always asked me how I feel. I don't even know. I was just drunk. I was intoxicated. This is where I got shot at. I was coming from a party. I stumbled out here. I came to this street right here, which is North Avenue. And I stuck my hand out because in Baltimore, we have what you call hacks, where you stick your hand out, Somebody pull over, pick you up, they take you to your destination, charge you a couple dollars. Somebody pull over, you jump in. Well, anyway, I was coming right here to get a hack. And two guys approached me right here, said, give me all your jewelry, give me all your money. Um, I picked my hands up. I gave them everything. I turned around to run, and they just shot. And I got hit once. If you listen to the verse, go higher, you'll hear me. Thank God, because I know he here because they shot multiple times, but only one hit me and it wasn't life threatening. So I came out of it good through the grace of God. But what's even more special was this was 2.30 in the morning. This street right here was empty. I pretty much was right here in the street and a guy pulled over and picked me up. He said, you know you shot. He said, look down, you bleed, you bleed. So I see the blood all on my pants and everything. He said, I'm gonna take you to the hospital. Um, he took me to Good Samaritan Hospital. The next day, the doctor said, um, you know, somebody dropped you off and left and they didn't even leave their name. Honestly, wish that I never was pretty much born in this city into this situation. That's the change I wish that I wish I never was honestly born into Baltimore because it's a very tough situation to get out of. The, the trials and tribulations that you have to go through here is much harder and much different. The it's demon you face with every day here is a different type of demon. It's strong. It, it can make you become the streets, whether you want to or not. The first time I got locked up, um, yeah, it was for it was for selling drugs. Um, I came home on bond, but. Um, the time when I sat was actually for something that I didn't do. The police report said three unknown black males. We can't identify them at the time, but if we saw them, we could recognize them. And um, I didn't do that. I would never do that, but they locked me up for it anyway. That's all I remember is pretty much the police riding, picked us up, it was me, a couple of other guys, picked us up, said, we're gonna ask y'all some questions, took us down the station, asked us about a robbery. We, we told them we knew nothing, and they told us we did it and locked us up. Next thing I know, I was sitting for like over a year, just going back and forth to court for something I didn't do. You know, being young, 16 years old, locked up with, you know, a bunch of grown men. Um, even though when I was in the streets, I was living like a grown man anyway. 
Um, it was kind of, um, I say it was kind of rough, you know, because um, jail rough, period. I mean, being without your freedom and, you know, somebody tell you when you can do, when you can take a bath and it's just rough, period. But being 16, it definitely was a bad thing. I lost over a year of my life, but it was very significant because this is where I was saved at, right here. It was about maybe like five months in, um, I had started getting a little comfortable. You never could get comfortable in there, but as comfortable as you can get. I heard like clapping and and what I know now is prison in the, in the cafeteria. So um, my bunk buddy came back and I asked him, I said, what's going on in there? He said, um, well, it's church. He said, the next time they come, you might need to check it out. I said, okay, I'm gonna take you up on that. He was a good guy, you know, he taught me dominoes, pinochle, you know, all, all types of things. Um, he just was a good laid back type of guy. Um, One of them people who came into your life, played the role and then disappeared, you know, uh, one of them type things, you know, but you, if he ever see this documentary, you know, I'm just let you know, man, thank you. I love you for that, man. You saved my life for real. God used you. Now I know the, the role that he played, you know, the influential role that he played on getting me to go in there. He was being used that day by God. I went to the service, um, the ministry, the jail ministry. It was a guy that he was talking. I remember specifically, he was just talking about um, how God, you can get peace and joy th through, through Christ. I felt like he was talking to me that day. So on that day, I got saved. It was probably one of the most happiest days of my life, even though I was locked up. And uh, matter of fact, right after I left out of there, um, I got a tattoo on my leg that said, in God I trust. Once you come through these doors right here, and that door lock, terrible thing, man. I pray for everybody in here. Pray for everybody in here, man. I spent my time in here going back and forth to court because, like I said, the state wanted me to accept a deal, but I didn't do it. So if I'm innocent, why would I take a deal? So I went back and forth to trial, you know, for over a year. You listen to the second verse and go higher. You hear where I say I spent Christmas in here, um, didn't get no mail, didn't get no visits alone. It was a real crucial time in my life too because um, I was going through a bunch of things with my mom. She had a real abusive um, boyfriend. And um, I remember one time she came to see me and it was dead winter and she had on sunglasses. And I said, mom, you know, take off the sunglasses. She took them off and you know, both of her eyes was black. And she told me this man was locking her in a room you know, threatening a killer with a hammer. She tried to leave. And being in here, not being able to console my mother or help her out of that situation really hurt me. It really did. But I did, like I said, this, this impacted my life tremendously because without this experience, I wouldn't have got saved. So me being in here was pretty much like almost the best thing that ever could have happened to me. I pray that everybody in this facility can be saved. Just give your life over to Christ. You can live a good life even if you're inside of here. You can live free. No more bondage. I was pretty much doing real good after I got released. Um, that's when I went back to school, got my GED, went to college. I met my beautiful wife, um, was doing good, working a decent job, making decent money. And um, pretty much one day, 
I ran back into the devil. So this right here is Perkins Projects, better known as public housing. Uh, when I came home from, from jail, from being saved, I moved down here with my mom. My mom lived here. This is where I spent 10 years of my life. Yeah, I pretty much dropped my clothes off. <laughs> and um, I might have stayed a couple nights, but you know, I was everywhere, you know. So you can say I, I live with my mom because that's basically where my clothes was based at, but I was all over. Yeah, he had got out there and got a taste, so he didn't want to come back to mama's house. <laughs> got caught up and just lived in a, a life of partying, um, disarray, and just a lot of negativity. But here's where I learned one thing. Righteousness cannot be mixed with, with wickedness. The light cannot mix with darkness. It doesn't work. Then they start having my nephews and them started rapping. <laughs> yeah, we had a group called the Ghetto Gods. <laughs> it was a good thing when it was happening. Um, it was an outlet for us. Um, we all felt like we were talented and um, everybody loved creating music. Just like anything else in the streets, as you get older, um, the streets bring decay. And like the reason why, you know, we left it alone is because we got older and um, really like the streets became our endeavors. Um, music was no longer important. Um, that's what the street does. It takes um, the important things out of your life replace your dreams with street dreams. I let the devil um, come in. As you know, everybody know that's his job. You know, he roam around looking for people to destroy. So he slid in on me and um, used deception as far as uh, easy money. I got caught in the trap and started, started hustling again. It had came a point in time where I knew and I felt in my heart that I didn't belong out there anymore. Um, I got tired of the devil pulling my strings because everybody know he a puppet master. Just being surrounded by pain and um, seeing a lot of death, actually. Um, a lot of people was dying, whether it was from getting killed or it was from AIDS or it was just from drugs, just decay, um, a lot of pain. And um, I just got tired because I knew that um, I didn't belong there. I got out the streets and it was like a fish out of water when I did because I was so used to making good, fast money and um, seemed like it was kind of hard to find my way. So um, when I got out when, when I got out the streets, it was like a pivotal time in my life because now I know it was meant to be like that. It's sort of like I hit rock bottom. I was homeless. Um, I was going from house to house. Uh, I didn't have any money at all. I mean, the struggle was real. Um, I had finally picked up a job. Um, I went from basically being in the streets to making thousands and thousands of dollars to being a dishwasher. I was going from house to house, and my aunt offered me um, to stay there, the same aunt who um, played a pivotal role into raising me when I was younger. She offered me the opportunity to come back and stay with her and get back on my feet. And um, I jumped at it. Um, I, wa I needed that love. I needed to be in that environment. I had separated myself from my family, um, basically couldn't provide for my family anymore. I just chose that because I didn't want my loved ones to suffer from, you know, my mistakes in life. So. I had to get out there and find my way. 
So, you know, it was it was real low time for me, um, a real hurtful time. Um, I contemplated suicide several times. One time was even almost really, really close to doing it. Um, I had a cup of bleach there. Um, I was close. And um, during that time, when I was really close to, you know, wanting to leave here, I was in my aunt's basement. And one day, um, a sermon came on. And um, it was a pastor by the name of Joyce Myers. And um, the sermon was a uh, battlefield of the mind. I watched that sermon that night. That same night, I surrendered my life back over to Christ. And, you know, ever since then, it's been up and up and up. Right after I surrendered myself back over to Christ, a blessing came my way. Opportunity came, a buddy of mine called me and said, um, I'm in a good position. One of my workers um, just quit. I got a position for you. And um, this position was in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. You know, since we moved to Pennsylvania, it was like God opened our eyes, our minds, and our horizons. So it was like, you know, one day my wife was like, you know, let's, you know, let's start a service. Let's come up with a service. And it was like, the first thing was like moving. It started getting bigger than what we ever could imagine. And um, we've been doing really, really good ever since through the grace of God. And we continue to pick God first and let God lead our steps and all our endeavors, God first, ministry, family business we always pick God first and when you do that you can't go wrong we decided to go get my mother before we knew she was dying uh, we didn't know when we went and got her it was like when I seen her I automatically teared up because it was like, it was like looking at death and I knew something was wrong. I don't know if my mom knew she had cancer or not. Um, I set her up with a primary care doctor and when we went to see our primary care doctor, her primary care doctor said, you know, you're in the late stages of colon cancer. You don't really have a, a, a whole lot of time here. It was like devastating because it was like, to me, I'm just now getting myself back right with the Lord. And now my mom about to leave here. She about to die. I just cried out to the Lord. And I said, um, you know, the devil stole almost my mom entire life. Can you give me the opportunity, Lord? Can you give my mom the opportunity to see me grow, to see me walk and grow in righteousness? And um, can she have the opportunity to enjoy or can you give her back all the years that the devil stole from her? And this had one on for a couple days. And then I felt like this peace come across me. And um, I told our doctor when we went to our appointment, I told our doctor, I said, my mom's eyes was white this morning. She's healed. And her doctor said, well, that's a good way to look at it. And I was like, no, no, you don't understand. That's the only way to look at it. This been six years, this the six years she just wanted to see her primary care doctor. And um, they still saying she a walking miracle. To this day, they still saying she a walking miracle. You know, God heals. My purpose for doing this is to show any body who are willing to listen 
that God is real. I just would like people to know that he's sovereign, he's good. Um, his love is beyond any love you ever can imagine. We need to reach our younger generation so that we can lift these generational curses so that the generations under them, their kids and their kids, you know, can be able to stand strong and, and fight the devil and um, live the life that God want them to live, a, a life of abundance, a, a true life. But my thing is that I'm happy for him and that one day, one day I really seriously truly believe that he, he's going to make it and either I'm going to be there while he make it or if I'm not, he's going to be looking up at me and say, Ma, I made it. And I'll be like, yeah, that's my boy. <laughs> I knew he got it. I knew he had it in him. I know he got it in him. The name Godson came because that's who I am. I'm God's son.